Hey everyone, my name is Alex and today at Big Al Books I'm doing my February wrap up. I made it through eight books this month. Three of them were nonfiction, one of them was a collection of short stories, four of them were novels, and two of those novels were new releases. So I've got some books about death, I've got some books by Canadian authors, I got some books that I read for Black History Month, and I've got some books by George Saunders. So let's get started. Alright, so starting off we have The Right to Be Cold by Sheila Watt Cloutier. And this is one of the five Canada Read uh, books on the shortlist and it's the only nonfiction title on the shortlist. Uh, this is a memoir and Sheila takes us through her life from the time when she was born in Nunavik, which is a northern region of Quebec, all through her uh, political career where she's done a lot of important work on the international scene protecting the rights of people living in the Arctic. Uh, so she's done work in keeping pollution levels down as well as her more recent work on climate change, uh, which is very interesting because she argues that climate change is not just an environmental issue, but it's also a human rights issue as well. So for a lot of people living in more southern climates, we tend to think of climate change as something that will be affecting us in the future and that it's not really a problem right now. But Sheila is showing us that in the Arctic, for people living there, they're seeing effects right now. And Inuit peoples have been living in the Arctic for thousands of years and they are seeing changes at this unprecedented rate. So we've got permafrost that's melting, so these houses are collapsing, as well as hunters who are falling through the ice because it's melting earlier than ever. She shows us that climate change is happening now and reminds us that the Arctic is the barometer for the rest of the planet. So if things are going wrong with Earth's natural <laughs> air conditioning system, we're going to see a lot of negative effects in other places. Her work in putting a human face on climate change is really important when a lot of people are more concerned with the well-being of polar bears in the north rather than the actual people who live there and have been living there for thousands of years. She does a great job of teaching us why this right to be cold is so important in the Inuit culture and they have such a strong connection to the land and this cold climate defines so much of who they are and why they eat the food that they do or why they have certain skills and values. It's a very important part of what it means to be Inuit. She shows us that it's not just the environment at stake, but an entire culture and a people's way of life as well. So this book was really eye-opening in that sense. I found the writing could be rather tedious sometimes. She'd go into a little bit too much detail about the whole international lobbying process. So it wasn't always like a fast-paced read, but I'm really glad that I did read it. I learned a lot about the North, which is a part of my country that gets neglected far too often. So I'm glad that I picked this one up. Up next, I have The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, and I recently filmed a review video on this book. So if you'd like to hear more of my thoughts, I'll link that down below. But basically, I enjoyed this one more than I was expecting to. I don't normally love dystopian future novels, but this one was pretty creepy. Uh, it's a very stressful read, so especially if you identify as a female, this is a pretty bone-chilling view of the future, so read this one at your own peril. Since February is Black History Month, I thought I would check out an American classic. Uh, this is Richard Wright's Native Son, and this is a book about Bigger Thomas, who is a black man living in a slum in Chicago, and he ends up taking a job for a rich white family, and let's just say shit goes very wrong. So this book has to, a lot to do with race relations, and it's kind of about all of the frustrations that Bigger feels. So. You know, he lives in America and he knows what the American dream is and he goes to the movies and he's sold this vision of the future where anything's possible, but then his life is very different in reality where people are racist and he's not given equal opportunities and it's this self-perpetuating cycle almost. So it was an interesting character study of someone who is really trapped by his own fear and anger and some of the damaging things that can happen because of that. This novel has a lot of communist ideas at play, especially when criticizing the well-intentioned white family that Bigger works for. Uh, basically, Bigger's boss owns a bunch of the apartment buildings in a black neighborhood in Chicago, and he is crazy overcharging for these really shitty apartments. Um, but he thinks that he's a good person because he is buying ping pong tables for black youth centers. So it's basically showing that meaningful societal change is going 
going to take a lot more than good intentions and ping pong tables. This is by no means a perfect novel, and I think it could have benefited from trimming down its length. I'm especially referring to the infamous scene with the communist lawyer at the end who just talks at you for over 50 pages. That is very painful to get through. But I'm glad that I finally checked this novel out, and I look forward to reading more Richard Wright in the future. Also in honor of Black History Month, I checked out Notes of a Native Son by James Baldwin. I've read a few of his novels before. This is my first time checking out his nonfiction, but oh my god. Like, the more I read James Baldwin, the more I fall in love with his writing style and his ability to craft these gorgeous sentences. If you don't believe me, I'd like to take this opportunity to read a sample of Mr. Baldwin's writing. This is from the introduction to Notes of a Native Son. <clears throat> Otherwise, I love to eat and drink. It's my melancholy conviction that I've scarcely ever had enough to eat. This is because it's impossible to eat enough if you're worried about the next meal. And I love to argue with people who do not disagree with me too profoundly, and I love to laugh. I do not like Bohemia or Bohemians. I do not like people whose principal aim is pleasure, and I do not like people who are earnest about anything. I don't like people who like me because I'm a Negro. Neither do I like people who find in the same accident grounds for contempt. I love America more than any other country in the world, and, exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. I think all theories are suspect, that the finest principles may have to be modified, or may even be pulverized by the demands of life, and that one must find, therefore, one's own moral center, and move through the world hoping that this center will guide one aright. I consider that I have many responsibilities, but none greater than this, to last, as Hemingway says, and get my work done. I want to be an honest man and a good writer. Ugh, I'm so sold on James Baldwin. Uh, these essays cover an interesting range of topics. Uh, there's one essay that tears apart Native Son that I enjoyed because I just read Native Son. Uh, apparently it quite severed his friendship with Richard Wright, but he basically argues that it is a piece of protest fiction with ultimately two-dimensional characters and is not really successful as a piece of art, but rather as a vehicle for its message. Um, he also talks about his relationship with his father, particularly after his father died. So if you read Go Tell on the Mountain, you know that they had a complicated relationship. And as well, he talks about what it's like to be black living in America and in Harlem versus living in Europe. So he writes about what it's like to live in Paris, and he has this funny slash horrifying story about how he got arrested and sent to prison, basically because of these accidentally stolen bed sheets. As well, he talks about living in a remote village in Switzerland and dealing with people who had never seen a black person before. So these were really thought-provoking and well-written essays, and I can't wait to get to more of these. Up next, we have 10th of December by George Saunders. I just read Civil Warland in Bad Decline a few months ago, so this is my second collection of George Saunders' stories. Um, it's not as satire-focused as the stories in Civil Warland in Bad Decline are, um, but I still thought he struck a nice balance between funny and sentimental. You know, he's got these stories that will make you laugh, but they also make you feel something, which I enjoy. I don't think they're the most memorable batches of stories, and some of them I've already forgotten and I didn't read it that long ago, but I did enjoy them at the time of reading. I especially liked the title story, 10th of December did make me cry, but that is only a foreshadow of how much <laughs> I wept when I read Lincoln in the Bardo, which is George Saunders' first novel that just came out a few weeks ago. I know this novel is probably already hyped enough, but holy hell, I loved this thing. Uh, it takes place in a graveyard after the death of Abraham Lincoln's son, Willie Lincoln. And George Saunders got his inspiration for this novel when he heard that after the death of his son, Abraham Lincoln actually went and visited the crypt in order to hold his dead son in his arms. And George Saunders was really thinking about, like, what would motivate a person to do that? Like, how much would you have to be feeling to go actually go and, you know, touch the body? 
So yeah, this one's very death focused. Uh, all our main characters are dead people in this like in between stage. Uh, they're dead, but they haven't quite moved on to the afterlife. I get super freaked out when I think about death, but at the same time, I like doing that. I really enjoy how different authors envision scenarios for what the afterlife might be like. And so I really did enjoy spending time with these dead characters. Uh, the novel is kind of structured like a play in a lot of ways. So you see we kind of jump around from voices of characters. Uh, so it makes it a really easy read. They're not big paragraphs. You're kind of just jumping around from voice to voice. So it definitely made for like an interesting formal experiment. Ultimately, this novel deals with whether it's better to hang on to every shred of humanity that we have and hold on to our existence, or whether it might be better to let go of it all and go into that terrifying unknown of life after death. And that for me is such like an interesting concept. So I totally loved this novel. It made me very emotional by the end. I was just like sobbing for like a whole day. But I, I really, I enjoyed this thing. And it, it was also interesting from the historical perspective, thinking about what it would be like for Abraham Lincoln to have just lost this son that was so important to him and then be at the start of the Civil War where his actions are kind of causing other people to be going through those same feelings of loss as they're losing their sons after these battles. So uh, it's a hell of a novel and definitely I recommend checking it out. So while I was reading uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, I was also reading Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory by Caitlin Doughty. So I was basically just thinking about death for a few days this month. <laughs> um, I decided to read this book because I really like Caitlin's YouTube channel, Ask a Mortician. I think she has a great personality and I just love the way she talks about death. This is a memoir and it is mostly about the time in Caitlin's life when she was working at a crematory. And so there's a lot of crazy stories about weird decomposing dead bodies and just like what a strange day-to-day -day existence it is working in that kind of work environment. But it also gets really heavy and philosophical because she is forced to confront a lot of feelings working with these dead bodies um, that the average person doesn't get to experience. She's critical about the way that Americans, and I'm going to include Canadians in there too, basically just try to hide death as much as possible. We don't really look at bodies, and if we do, they're like heavily embalmed and made up. And we don't really engage with the idea that we and all of our loved ones are gonna die one day uh, which creates this kind of anxiety around the topic where she's saying for you know most of human history and all sorts of different cultures all over the world people have these different rituals and uh, which are ways that they um, engage with dead bodies and basically come to terms with death whereas if we just kind of hide bodies and don't we're not really accepting anything so that was a very interesting perspective and it is kind of a good thing to talk to your loved ones about what you want your plans to be and to kind of focus on building your own philosophy about death. This is a fairly quick read and I appreciate how Caitlin kept things from getting too heavy and depressing by consistently using her humor throughout the book. So if you're not too squeamish reading about dead bodies, uh, this is a fun book that will also get you thinking. So last up on the list is Universal Harvester by John Darnielle. If you don't recognize that name, uh, John Darnielle is the frontman of the band The Mountain Goats, and they're one of my favorites. So I've been really excited over the past few years since Darnielle has turned to writing as well. So his last novel was Wolf in White Van, which came out a few years ago, and it was like an excellent character-driven novel. Universal Harvester is, is a puzzling one, and I just finished it yesterday, so I still kind of need time to process how I feel about this one. It is set in a small town, Nevada, Iowa, in the late 1990s, and it's about a guy who works at a video rental store, and basically there are people that are coming and making complaints that there's been some strange footage 
on the videotapes. I was expecting this to be a kind of mystery about who was making these disturbing images on these tapes and trying to find this person, but it's really not about that. So if you are a plot driven reader, I would not recommend this book. It's really slow paced actually. This is a very low key and quiet kind of novel. I read in an interview John Darniel was talking about how he's attracted to writers like Willa Cather whose books don't really have that much going on but kind of take you into the lives of the characters and I wouldn't say that he is nearly as successful as Willa Cather because I just don't think we got to spend really enough time to get an in-depth picture of these characters, but I will say that he was successful in bringing to life Iowa. Not that I really know anything about small town Iowa, but I, I felt he conjured up a good sense of place, as well as there was this haunting melancholy feel throughout the whole work that I enjoyed. So this book wasn't as creepy or as exciting as I hoped it was going to be, but it's still made for a good late night novel and I will still be checking out anything that John Darniel does in the future. Alright, so those were all of the books I managed to get to in February. Let me know if you have any thoughts about these books or if you read anything good this month. Thanks for watching!